What is global health? What are the agencies involved? And how have they affected health at the global scale? What is an emerging or re-emerging disease? What causes that to happen? And how are animals involved in the whole process? Uh, this latter one being particularly important for the current global pandemic of COVID-19. And then finally, what is the study of epidemiology and how does it relate to global health and patterns of disease? So global health is defined, defined as the collaborative transnational research and action for promoting health for all. That's taken directly from the World Health Organization. Uh, simply being it is the area of study, research, and practice that places a priority on improving health and achieving e equity in health for all people world. Wide. Um, essentially, it's health at a broad scale without borders. It is a huge topic. Uh, for instance, Boston University has a global health department and school for public health. This exists at Harvard. This exists at all these big universities. Uh, this is a big deal. Um, it is something that um, is, again, without borders, because as we've seen with this current global pandemic, health does not have borders. There, are, there, there is no sort of limit to where disease will spread or how things will proliferate through society. It doesn't matter what culture you are, doesn't matter what language you speak, what religion you are, health is a global issue. Um, and even within a given country, things like health are a national issue. What we do here in Massachusetts can directly affect what happens in California or Texas or anywhere else. So health is something that crosses borders. Um, it's something like, you know, like pollution where there is no defined borders. And so global health um, is been really important. Um, we, you know, we sort of think about like, you know, the failures of global health, um, which are many, um, as a bad thing. But as we'll hope, you'll hopefully see today, there's been a lot of really great successes for global health and thinking about the planet and the human population as sort of one global part, um, one global group. So um, there are many different perspectives to understand um, how health is globally. So we have medicine, which describes the pathology of disease and promotes prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. We have public health, which is emphasizes the health of populations, both locally and globally. We have epidemiology, which helps us identify risk factors and causes of health problems, as well as how they will spread. We have demography, which provides data for policy decisions. And then finally, we have economics, which emphasizes how we can do things cost effectively and have a cost benefit approach for the optimal allocation of health resources. As you all know, um, healthcare is not cheap, especially here in the United States, where we don't have a socialized healthcare system. Um, other countries, such as the European Union, they have a much more cent they have a centralized healthcare situation. It is it is um, free. Things are a bit different. So healthcare does vary pretty dramatically, and there's varying levels of economic impact depending on where you are in the planet. Um, so first up, we have management. Uh, so this is the big, essentially thinking about big. Uh, something that's big like global health, it's something that requires a lot of management and oversight. Um, it allows us to determine the important health goals, allows us to acquire and allocate resources, both money, um, but as well as doctors, medicines, machinery, things like that. It allows us to synthesize and distribute important information. Um, in the past, so pre-World War II, this was done by each country. So for instance, the United States Federal Security Agency, which is now the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, but global health does require um, global in oversight. And this is where the World Health Organization comes in, one of the most trusted sources for health um, and as well as disease and things like that. So this organization was founded after World War II in 1948. It's a special agency of the United Nations. Um, and it's headquartered in Geneva. And their mission, as, as noted on their site, is the attachment by, I'm sorry, the attainment by all people of the highest possible levels of health. Um, and this was actually formed in partially in response to a cholera epidem epidemic in Egypt that killed over 20,000 people. Um, but the World Health Organization is a really important organization. It's something you don't quite physically see the effects of on a day-to-day -day basis, but it has been extremely important for minimizing the effects of diseases globally. Um, and it is, and it is, it, and again, it's not that's something you physically see on a day-to-day -day basis, um, or you might think is not doing so well because of our current pandemic, but it is something that does help keep things abate and help things keep them from getting worse over time. And it has spread, spearheaded multiple notable health initiatives, including the eradication of smallpox in 1958. So smallpox is one of the most infectious diseases of all time. 
Um, at the time, there was about 50 million cases of smallpox, smallpox per year, um, with approximately 2 million of those people dying. And so they started this initiative in 1970, I'm sorry, 1958, and by 1979, um, we had successful eradication of, of smallpox. So there's no longer smallpox that spreads through the world. This is, again, all spearheaded by the World Health Organization. Smallpox, is, smallpox used to infect, again, 50 million people a year, and it's been doing this for generations and generations. So this is, a, this is a huge, huge thing that happened. And I will just mention that smallpox was eradicated, again, through better public health, but also through vaccination. Um, as we talked about um, with, and we talked about Edward Jenner in our vaccination lecture. Um, in 1988, they established the global polio eradication. Um, this was something that was already eradicating the United States, already eradicating the United States, but there is still three countries in the world that still have it, including uh, Nigeria, Afghanistan, as well as Pakistan. And you can look at the number of re reported cases of polio per year. Um, and so you see this is, dates back into the 1970s. And again, they started in 1988 here. And you'll notice is that we see this after this, this uh, sort of thing was developed, we see a dramatic decrease over time. And now we're heading down to very small numbers. And so for instance, last two years ago in 20, I'm sorry, three years ago in 2017, uh, there's only 22 cases reported globally. So polio is heading towards an eradication um, if things continue the way they are. But that being said, the rise of the anti-vaccination movement, as we've talked about, is leading to the proliferation of diseases, and we actually might see a polio come back. Um, we're unlikely to see smallpox ever come back in a meaningful way, simply because there's no reservoir environmentally or anything like that, or any cases globally, but something like polio, we're seeing it with measles, has the potential to come back. So um, we're gonna think about global health from a microbiology perspective, since we're a microbiology course. And so we're going to think about um, the concepts that underlie some of the key aspects of global health, thinking about emerging and re-emerging diseases, zoonosis, which is really important to think about COVID-19, uh, non-sacomal infections, and then finally, epidemiology. So let's start off with emerging and re-emerging. So emerging is essentially infections whose incidence has increased in the past 20 years and could increase in the near future. So this accounts for about 12% of all human pathogens, and then any new pathogen fits into this category, whether it's swine flu, SARS, COVID-19. And there's lots of possible reasons to this, including the adaptation of the disease to the treatment, increases in immunocompromised individuals, so something like HIV or any other of the many, many immune diseases out there, um, as well as changes in climate and changes in um, changing in the economics of the government. So we're seeing large scale, large scale immersion, uh, emerging of diseases in Venezuela due to the terrible situation that's going in there. Um, in addition, we're seeing habitat loss as well as changes in travel. And we'll talk about that in a brief moment because it ties directly into our next one, which is re-emerging infections that were essentially at, were at a baseline or decreasing and are now increasing at an incidence rate. And same factors as above, so travel and things like that. Um, these include things like measles, as well as methicillin resistant, Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA. But travel is a really important thing to think about for how diseases spread globally. And I think this is an important thing to think about in the light of COVID-19. We as a society are more and more connected as we, um, as time goes on. We are not just a United States, you know, first United States only thing. We are heavily, heavily connected. And I think this map of global airline traffic in, uh, sort of visualizes this perfectly. We are, you know, even you know, within the United States, we're incredibly, incredibly connected. But even to Europe, to South America, to China, to Australia, to everything, we are connected. And even if we're not directly connected to a country, we are indirectly connected to it. I also like this flight pattern um, from the Chicago area all the way down to India, where you sort of just whoop over the top. Anyways, it's beyond the point. Um, but one, one of the reasons that diseases such as COVID-19 is easy to spread is because we're so well connected. Um, and it is absolutely amazing how much airline traffic there is, and it allows diseases to spread to ways that we've never quite seen them before. Something like COVID-19 would have normally just been locally endemic to China and Asia to sort of travel, say, uh, post, you know, pre-World War II, where air travel and travel by train wasn't as such a huge deal. But now COVID-19 has the capacity to spread so rapidly and so quickly, simply because of how much air travel there is. I will also mention there is also this hypothesis out there 
that our interconnectivity due to air travel is actually making us more adapted to diseases over time. Um, um, that being said, there's not a, a whole ton of uh, sort of evidence for that. So, so that's travel. Uh, we're actually going to talk about climate a little bit. Um, in climate change, we don't really talk about it in this class very much, but it is one of the biggest problems we are currently facing on this planet. It is number one on the United Nations most concerning things that the world is facing right now, even more so than um, infectious diseases and things like that. But as we all know, um, the climate is changing due to man-made um, carbon dioxide and methane being pumped into the atmosphere. This is causing a greenhouse effect, which is causing increased temperatures, which is causing sea level rise, which is causing a whole rash of different changes to the Earth's climate. And I think it's important to just highlight the climate is something we think about on a yearly, not a year to year basis, but a decadal scale. Our climate is changing on long term patterns, not just changes in weather from year to year. Um, that being said, climate is sort of not only just affecting the planet as a whole, but it's also affecting um, how diseases spread and reservoirs for diseases as a whole. So there was an article published in, the, in PLOS One um, in 2019, which is looked at trop neglected tropical diseases. And then from this article, they said, global expansion and redistribution of edis borne virus transmission risk with climate change. Um, and I also just, just want to take a moment to recognize that there's a whole journal for neglected tropical diseases out there. And so this is sort of a big deal. Um, so we think that as things get warmer, it's going to have a much more wider spread distribution of, um, say, insect vector as well as tropical diseases moving into, say, Europe, the United States, things like that. Uh, but ultimately, as the temperature increases, the range for tropical mosquitoes will move towards the poles. And this includes the Aedes mosquito. And the Aedes mosquito is one of the sort of the most, I guess the biggest jerk of all the mosquitoes because it carries Zika, it carries Dengue, it carries yellow fever, and it carries Chikanagua. And the idea being is it's exposing already exposed people um, to these diseases for a longer period of time, which is bad. However, it's exposing new populations to these diseases even longer, which is equally as bad. I will also say that uh, Aedes mosquito also does uh, carry um, malaria as well. So we can look at some just some data of this. So this is the current ranges for mosquitoes and how many billions are exposed and for how many months. And so we can look at the population density um, here. This is sort of looking at uh, how much of the population is exposed for how long. But what you can notice is that um, we're seeing that the current range of the, for these mosquitoes is typically in the tropics, but we do expect those ranges to shift upwards and to be exposed for longer periods of time. Um, in addition, if we sort of project things going forward, we actually expect the future temperature will make transmission from uh, mosquitoes um, much more exposure. So as we go from uh, looking at so Aedes aegypti as well as Aedes you know, allotropicus, two important mosquitoes for transmission of the diseases. As you'll notice, as we go from current to 2050 to 2080, projections just show that their range is expanding globally. So it doesn't particularly have a um, import. It doesn't particularly paint a good picture going forward. So in terms of emerging and re-emerging diseases, um, the death rate from infectious diseases has increased since 1982 in the United States, which is exactly opposite of the way you would think. And so we can look at some hotspots for different infectious disease. Um, so these are the locations of emerging and re-emerging infections, diseases, and pathogens. Um, these examples represent extreme increases in the reported cases over the last 20 years. Uh, many of these diseases, such as HIV, AIDS, uh, cholera, are widespread, but show alarming increases in the area indicated. So you can look at, um, say, spreading of, of say, SARS um, increasing rapidly. You can think of a spread of um, any of these things, such as HIV, um, which is a global problem, but it's expanding faster than we've expected. And so, for instance, case in sort of things that are um, relevant to us now, um, cases of the H1N1 swine flu have increased around the globe. Um, and the question we can ask is why? Um, and so many of these respiratory symptoms are emerging um, sort of in local areas, but it's allowed, but our sort of our inter interconnectivity as well as sort of the changes in demography are allowing these things to spread to other countries, including the United States and globally. Um, and uh, all these cases are typically linked through travel and again, how connected we are. 
Um, but emergent infectious diseases, or EID for short, um, um, typically is occurring between 30 degrees and 60 degrees north, so the northern hemisphere. So thinking about this range of the globe as a whole. Um, and this is likely due to socioeconomic factors, including increasing population densities, antibiotic drug use, as well as changes in our agricultural, um, <clears throat> our, um, as, our, as well as our um, agricultural practices. Um, I will also mention before this paper came out, so this paper that came out in 2008, we actually thought all these emerging infectious diseases were actually popping up only in the tropics, but now we know because of the way we're behaving in Europe, the United States, China, and so on and so forth, um, we're, we're actually seeing a higher, pop, higher jump in these emerging infectious diseases um, in the Northern Hemisphere. And part of these infectious diseases are actually doing, occurring due to a process called zoonosis. And this is a process or infection that is naturally transmissible from vertebrate animals to humans. So thinking of cow to human, pig to human, bat to human. And essentially, um, these diseases are particularly hard to take care of. And I think our struggles with COVID-19 have really illustrated how hard it is to understand how these things move from animal reservoir to humans. But ultimately, animals do play a central role for maintaining viral as well as bacterial infections in nature. Pathogens without what sort of without what they're colonizing will eventually die off. And so essentially, by having animals be carriers of these, it acts as a reservoir for these pathogens. And these diseases are pretty variable. They can be bacterial, viral, or parasitic, or something like an uncon unconventional pathogen, like a prion. Um, prions are probably the scariest thing because uh, prion diseases like mad cow are uh, just proteins that are, that are slightly misfolded that cause an infectious disease. So they're really sort of an unknown reservoir of, of pathogens that we don't quite understand. But these zoonotic infections do comprise a large percentage of all new identified infectious diseases, as well as existing infectious diseases. And these are just predicted to increase going forward. And I think we all know um, how dire the consequences of these zoonotic diseases can be with COVID-19. And so microorganisms from animal reservoirs have the potential to adapt to human hosts and emerge as pathogens. So for instance, SARS um, and avian influenza, which came from uh, obviously birds, um, or, um, <clears throat> or livestock has the capacity to, um, through multiple levels of exposure, jump. Um, for instance, but in addition, many previously unknown human infectious disease have also emerged from animal resources. This includes HIV, Ebola, West Nile, hantavirus, and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of reservoirs for these diseases. And what these are occurring through is, is through repeated exposure. And we're typically thinking about these things as a lot of it is like they live near us or, and we're continuously exposed to their fecal matter or uh, that's in the case of like birds and bats or something like we're consuming them as livestock or we're hunting them as say bushmeat as what's happened, we think was what happened with COVID-19. Um, I would recommend you take a peek at this article down here from the New Yorker. It's a really nice article that sort of summarizes the current scientific thinking of how the virus evolved in bats at first and then evolved to be transmitted to humans and then proliferate inside of humans. But ultimately, these animal reservoirs account for more than three quarters of human diseases that are new, emerging, or re-emerging at the beginning of this century. Um, and essentially thinking about, this is about 61% of pathogens in general. So this is a huge, huge reservoir for us. And again, this can be something as simple as being exposed to, um, incidentally, to wildlife. You're thinking about getting uh, Lyme disease from a tick that was on a squirrel, or getting something like Ebola from a bat that just happened to be around. Um, you can also think about like, oh, it's incidental from livestock, right? You can think of something like E. coli jumping from chicken feces to us or cowpox jumping from cow udders to humans. Um, so there's any number of things. But currently, you can also think of like, well, maybe something that happens that directly puts the body, the virus inside of our body, like something like getting bit by an animal with rabies or getting bit by a mosquito for, for West Nile or ingesting it, you know, um, I'm sorry, not ingesting, but breathing it in with like anthrax or tuberculosis. So there's a number of different reservoirs that could potentially affect, um, I'm sorry, that could potentially be um, brought forth by um, animals. And when we think about this uh, globally, um, so this is just the, the breakdown of how we get uh, 
zoonotic diseases from this planet. And so you'll notice the biggest one is other, and this is just sort of includes international travel and commerce, changes in human demographics and behavior, changes in medical industry, climate and weather, and other un, sort of unspecified consequences. So that's the biggest one, but you'll notice is that um, one of the other big ones is how we change our land in terms of converting it to agriculture, um, industrial agricultural intensification, so becoming more and more close to our um, organisms uh, that we live and eat, I'm sorry, that we just eat, uh, changes in the food industry, so thinking about how we handle food, how we package food. Um, you also notice is that human susceptibility to infection, we're becoming potentially more susceptible the longer we're exposed to these animals. And then finally, I think the important one to think about in terms of COVID-19 is this bushmeat. And we know that um, COVID-19 came from the consumption of bushmeat, but I will also mention this is how HIV came into our population. The consumption of simians and chimpanzees led to a repeated exposure to the human population to HIV which led to this sort of dis the, the HIV jumping from our simian and uh, ape cousins to us. So bushmeat can be a potential major reservoir as we've seen with HIV, as we're currently seeing with COVID-19. But uh, we can potentially predict the emerging, emerging infectious disease risks using historical trends. And so the majority of zoonotic, uh, I'm sorry, the majority of emerging diseases are bacterial, uh, zoonotic or non-drug resistant and non-vector born um, here. And so we, we saw a spike in the 80s with co committing with the HIV pa pandemic. So HIV caused a pretty widespread boom in the infections. And there's still a general trend towards increasing infections, but we can potentially predict based upon where we were, how things are going to end up going forward. Um, in addition, we have what are called non-secomal infections, and these are typically hospital and inquired infections. And this is sort of what our nurses and doctors on the front line currently treating COVID-19 are experiencing. And so pathogens can develop within a hospital or other clinical care facilities, and that they can be acquired by patients or medical professionals while they're in the facility. Um, about 10% of all hospital patients acquire a non secomal infection. It could be higher depending on where you are in the world and how good your sort of sanitation methods are. But non secomal infections are pretty common and they can just be from going to get a test at the hospital or spending a week in the hospital because you're sick. But ultimately, the vast majority of non secomal infections are bacterial in origin. Um, and they're generally bacteria that we consider to be uh, part of our normal microbiota, and they ultimately become um, what we call opportunistic pathogens, as we discussed in the quorum sensing lecture. Um, there are many, many antibiotic resistant strains out there currently. Um, we've talked about MRSA in the class a bunch. Um, this is a, a non secomal infection, but there are, are tons of others, and the list is growing and growing and growing. And they include things like Pseudomonas. Um, they include things like enterococcus. So there's this whole wide range of bacteria. And we can look at um, how the, the frequency of non secomal infections by body site. And again, they are caused by um, typically um, by um, normal bacteria that you found in your gut. And so this is just looking at locations by site. So urinary tract, respiratory tract, wounds. Um, other sort of includes sort of anything that's not listed here, skin and blood. And you'll notice that depending on what part of your body it is, you have a very different sort of group of organisms that could potentially infect you. But you also have some particularly um, prolific organisms, including Staphylococcus, which can affect you on multiple areas of your body, Pseudomonas, again, multiple areas of your body, Enterobacter, Candidia, all ones that can infect multiple areas of your body. And so you can acquire an infection and infections can proliferate and spread simply by having, um, by visiting or working in or being a patient at a hospital. And the other thing that hospitals sort of breed, and as we, as we talked about in the antibiotic resistance lecture, is that and, uh, hospitals can breed antibiotic resistant bacteria. There's lots of horizontal gene transfer that occurs in these environments, and the, the, the the, um, the benefits of being antibiotic resistant in, in a hospital are enormous. So, um, so that's, that's infections. Um, let's move on to our next topic, which is going to be epidemiology, which evaluates the occurrence, determinants, distribution, and control of health and human disease in a defined human population.
Um, this was actually uh, put forth by John Snow in the, in the 1800s. He's considered the father of epidemiology. Um, John Snow, he did know things, uh, <laughs> and he, uh, he got, sort of got his name thinking about uh, cholera. And so there was a serious outbreak of cholera in London in 1854. What he did is he visited sick, sick people, and he was the first geographic analysis of a disease, and it allowed him to find the source of the disease, despite the fact that every cholera was discovered 50 years later. So he was able to figure out what was going on um, without physically having a, a culture of the microbe. Because remember, this is the time of microbiology. We still hadn't cultured anything. We're still just looking under the microscope. So we can look at um, uh, some maps of what, uh, of what he found. And so water in London was pumped from separate wells located in different neighborhoods. So we have deaths here in, uh, in red, and then we have different water pumps. And this is what these water pumps look like. And so what he was finding, there was a close association between the density of cholera cases and a single well located on Broad Street. So you see this well here, and there was a huge amount of cholera cases right here. And as you moved away from that well, you'd have less and less cases of cholera. This is John Snow's greatest contribution to epidemiology. He was one of the first and formal extensive biogeography studies of pathogenesis. And so there's the legend that removing the pump handle put an end to the epidemic, proving that the water well was the point source of infection. Um, but that's sort of unclear. But they eventually did clear the infection. Um, how they exactly did it is unclear. But uh, there is a saying that they just removed this, and it was it was all good. So um, that being said, this was all done before Vibrio cholera was actually physically recognized as a bacteria as well as a pathogen. We didn't isolate Vibrio cholera until 1905, which was 50 years after this little incident. Um, but ultimately, one of the key goals of epidemiology is to understand the patterns and trends of disease and how it progresses. And it allows us to make predictions and plan for future outbreaks of the disease. And so the idea being is when, we're, when you see sort of projections of current, you know, the current pandemic of COVID-19, people are using math, they're using what we know about how infectious diseases spread, about how people move, about how, how uh, the economy works to predict potentially how bad things are going to get. So I'm sure many of you have seen that, you know, the, the estimates from say like John Hopkins or the CDC say 100,000 plus people are going to die from COVID-19 in the United States. This is all due to epidemiological principles as a whole. But in terms of epi epidemics as a whole, um, there are two types of epidemics when we're thinking of how infectious diseases spread. So we have the common source epidemic, um, and this is results from a single contaminated source, such as a food. So you can think of something like food poisoning or like something like Legionnaire's disease, which is from like, in, like uh, tainted water. Uh, then we have propagated epidemic, which results from the introduction of a single infected individual to a susceptible population, which is then propagated by others. So this could be something like strep throat. This is something we're seeing with COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> and both have very different patterns of infection. So we can look at uh, onset of epidemic, time and days, number of individuals infected. You'll see that that common source epidemic sort of peters off pretty quickly once you identify the source. So it could be a food poison, right? They identified Chipotle was a source of, of say, norovirus, and they stopped the infection, allowed the infection and the epi epidemic to sort of peter off very quickly. Whereas you can see something like strep throat or even COVID-19 takes a much, much longer time for it to sort of abate. But you'll notice is that these common source epidemics are, are much more intense over a short period of time, whereas this one is sort of much more elongated. Um, <clears throat> but ultimately, um, we can look at uh, the percentage of total U.S. citizens' deaths from the 10 leading causes of death in 1900 and 2001. And what you'll notice is that uh, the, the, the idea being there's a, sort of this quote about this is that the public health landscape of 1900 was a value of death, the valley of death due to infectious disease. But notice is that septicemia, these blood poisoning has increased. I will just note that. But what you notice is that if we look at say pneumonia, tuberculosis, um, gastrointestinal diseases, they're all, well, these ones don't have any data, but they're decreasing over time. Whereas things like heart disease, cancer are increasing. Um, I also notice is that uh, septicemia or blood poisoning has increased. So um, but that being said, we, you know, the epidemiology, our capacity to deal with infectious organisms has only been, only gotten better in the past hundred years or so. Um, so this leads us to sort of some definitions. So we have an endemic, which is an infection that is constantly maintained at a baseline level in the geographic area without external inputs. So this is, for instance, chickenpox. It's always present throughout this population. 
it doesn't need to be reintroduced. We have an epidemic, it's an infection that is rapidly spread to a large number of people in a given population within a short period of time, and large is relative to its normal infection rate. Um, and so something like Ebola, which has a very low infection rate, 40, 50 cases, 200 cases is a big, is, is a pretty large um, race. And so Ebola is something that's sort of confined to one area, like say, Western Congo Basin or something like that. And then finally, we have pandemic, which is an infection that has spread across a large region, multiple continents or worldwide. And so this is what we saw with the Black Plague, um, what, 200 years ago or so? And this is what we're currently seeing with COVID-19. And the difference between pandemic and epidemic is simply just the area that it spreads over. Pandemic is not necessarily worse than an endemic in terms of infection rate, um, but uh, it is certainly much more widespread. And there are certainly many notable um, pandemics and epidemics across the world. So there's the plague of Athens in 430 BC or so, uh, which was probably typhoid fever, which killed you know, 75 to 100,000 people. Um, in this sort of this, this visualization of, of a painting of that, we had the Black Death in the 1300s, which was caused by the Yersinia pestis, which we'll talk about in another lecture. It killed between 75 to 200 million people, or 30 to 60 percent of the population at the time. We had the Spanish flu in the 19, uh, 18 and 1920. It, it infected between 50 and 100, I'm sorry, it killed between 50 and 100 million people, likely many, many more. And then finally, we had the Western Africa Ebola crisis in 2013 to 2016, which killed approximately 11,000 people. So there's been number, 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 number of endemics and pandemics over our history. We are not susceptible to, uh, even though we're really advanced, we're still susceptible to our microorganisms. And as we live sort of closer and closer together um, in higher population densities, it increases the probability that we're going to see more of these over time. And in fact, in 2013 uh, and 2015, after sort of the Ebola outbreak and the original SARS outbreak, you know, the, the scientists involved with that um, <clears throat> were saying we're primed for this to happen again. This is going to happen again. This is why the, the Obama administration developed uh, a pandemic and sort of and, uh, infectious disease task force. Um, unfortunately, it was disbanded by the current administration, um, which was probably one of the reasons why we didn't have a great response to this current pandemic that we're going on. Um, but there are another a number of, <clears throat> of interesting infections out there. So we have typhus, which is a bacterial infection. This is caused by Rickettsia prowensky. Um, it's an obligate intercellular pathogen. It is zoonotic. Its reservoir is actually the flying squirrel. Uh, there's funny YouTube videos of what they do, they don't like flap wings or anything, they just sort of glide and they're really, really aerodynamic. It's actually kind of cool. Um, interestingly enough, this decimated Napoleon's troops in Russia. Um, it killed more of Napoleon's than Russian troops, which is kind of interesting, and it kind of halted Napoleon in Russia. We have malaria, it's a, it's a eukaryotic disease, it's caused by the parasite Plasmodium falpertium, um, for instance, and it's one of the most infectious diseases currently on the planet. And so, for instance, in 2016, there was 216 million cases worldwide with an estimated, again, estimated, it's hard to know in, in places in Africa where testing and the economy is not so great. Um, with 400 to 700,000 deaths. And this is spread by that Aedes mosquito. And you'll notice that this is death due to malaria in per millions of people in 2012. Not very much where it's cold, lots of it in Africa, some of it in the tropics here in South America. And then finally, we have Kuru, which is a prion disease. And as I mentioned, prions are simply misshapen proteins that create more bad proteins and uh, essentially are infectious proteins. So you know, antibiotics don't work, virals don't work, nothing quite works. Um, prion diseases, I mentioned, are what caused my mad cow, but a really interesting type of prion disease is Kuru, which is actually transmitted by eating infected human tissue or infected um, uh, livestock tissue, like in particular eating brains. So um, it's commonly spread through cannibalism in African countries. So, so let's just summarize this first part. That's our global health and epidemiology point. I hope this uh, sort of shed a little bit more light in thinking about COVID-19 and thinking about how epidemiology plays or played a role in thinking about how this virus has spread. Um, but global health is the management of health goals at the global scale. It's managed globally by the World Health Organization. It's an amazing organization, and their effort has led to the eradication of several important diseases, uh, smallpox, 
uh, almost polio, and I'm sure it will lead to the eradication of many, many more diseases over time. It is a really effective organization that you don't see enough um, on a day-to-day -day basis, but they do incredibly important work. Um, emerging diseases represent a large problem for global health, as we currently know with our current pandemic, and they're due to many factors, including antibiotic use, travel, climate, habitat change, as well as population growth. Uh, zoonosis, the jumping from a pathogen from an, of an, from an, an animal to a human, like we, we're seeing with COVID-19, represents the largest source of EID, as well as pathogens in general. And then finally, epidemiology is the study of the patterns and prog progressions of diseases, and is it important for predicting changes in diseases and planning. So that's sort of our, our one of our last talks thinking about uh, uh, how microbes affect human. And so we're going to sort of finish up this course by thinking about how microbes um, make food, how microbes, um, how microbes keep us healthy, and how we use microbes to make things. So we're going to start off with food in this lecture, and in the following lecture, we'll think about the human microbiome. And so for food microbiology, we're going to answer these three questions. How are microbes involved in the production of food? Which microbial processes have given rise to some of your favorite foods? What is the role of fermentation in microbial foods? And what are the products of fermentation and the different types of fermentation? And how have microbes been used to prevent spoilage of food? But on the other hand, what are some of the key foodborne pathogens? Because, you know, with food microbiology, there's lots and lots of good, but there's also some really severely bad things. So humans have been using microbes for food production for millennia, and they're the earliest evidence for us using microbes for the production of food are tens of thousands, 10, 10,000 to 11,000 years ago for the production of wine. Um, so we've been using microbes to make our food for a very, very long time. But one of the most historically and commercially important processes that we use is fermentation. And... Um, and you, people tend to think of fermentation as something that only is really meaningful with, say, beer or wine. But fermentation is an incredibly important process for almost any type of food out there that requires microbes to make. But ultimately, fermentation, as we spoke about in the energetics class, is the metabolism only use organic substrates as reaction. So they're using carbon to derive energy. And again, these are always enzymatically driven reactions. Um, just as a note, the study of fermentation is called zymology, which I think is a cool but as I mentioned, we've been using fermenting for a long time. There's evidence of primitive beer found in Israeli caves that dates back to 13,000 years ago. We know that there's winemaking dating back to 6,000 years ago. Um, and so the evidence of purposely alcoholic beverages were in uh, Babylon and Egypt about 3,000 years ago. So about, about sorry, 3,000 BC or about 5,000 years ago at this point. Um, and the term fer fermentation itself dates back to Louis Pasteur in, in 1856, and he concluded that the fermentation of, was catalyzed by a vital force, which he called ferments within the yeast cells. He didn't really know, but that's, that's sort of how he, he figured it out. And it turns out that these ferments were enzymes that work outside of the cell too. And so these are called the zymase, and they were discovered in, uh, one, and someone discovered and won a Nobel Prize for them in 1907. So fermentation has many, many different types of fermentation, um, and they have many different products, and they all depend on what type of organism you're looking at. So ultimately, when we're thinking about fermentation, we're taking some sort of sugar, and we are fermenting it to an end product. And that end product, um, I'm sorry, the, to an intermediate, and that intermediate is pyruvic acid. And depending on what organism you are studying, whether it's propionibacterium or saccharomyces or clostridium, you produce a different end product. And so thinking about something we think of that, you know, that we think about all the time, we think about fermentation, like the production of wine and beer, we have the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae ferment pyruvic acid to ethanol and CO2. The CO2 is what gives beer its bubbly, alcohol gives obviously wine and it's in beer, it's alcoholiness. But in, in, in a sort of, in contrast to that, bacteria like acetobacteria will ferment pyruvic acid to acetic acid, which, which is essentially just as vinegar. Um, this is also what gives kombucha its flavor. Um, in addition, um, I also mentioned that it, for those of you that paint your nails, we actually use clostridia to make acetone as well as make isopropanol. And then finally, for those of you that like cheese or, um, or things like soy sauce, we use different types of bacteria to make lactic acid or propionic bacteria. To, I'm sorry, lactic acid um, or um, propionic acid. 
But ultimately, fermentation is one of the most important historically, socially, and economically important products, uh, processes that we use microbes for, and, the, and by far the most valuable thing we, in terms of uh, how much, uh, in terms of money-wise, in terms of fermentation, is the production of alcohol. And we can look at the per capita assumption of pure ethanol. So this is not just like how much beer, this is like just straight of, of alcohol that we drink every year. And you'll, you'll notice is that the darker colors you get is the more uh, liters per year. And you'll notice that uh, you know places like Europe have a pretty high consumption where places like Africa have a pretty low consumption. And so it is an incredibly important thing. So let's dive a little bit into and talk about ethanol fermentation. The idea being is for ethanol fermentation work, we combine our sugar and some yeast. Um, sometimes we also use ethanol ethanologenic bacteria, such as Zymomonas mobilis. Um, that's what's going on here. But typically when we're thinking about ethanol fermentation, we're thinking about yeast. All you do is combine yeast, sugar, you incubate it at some happy temperature, wait, and voila, we produce alcohol. And the idea being is we take glucose, um, <clears throat> And this process uh, through again through this enzymatic process ultimately what we're doing is what is, is what we're doing this is again this is not yeast but this is in the zyomonas bacteria we're taking glucose and through a stepwise process we're creating ethanol at the back end as well as co2 but the vast the most important organism to think about when we're thinking about fermentation of alcohol is actually saccharomyces um, and it's a genera of fungi there's many many genera of yeast um, many of which are uh, economically important for humans. But Saccharomyces is Greek for sugar fungus, um, and it's very important, important in the production of brewers uh, for making um, wine, bread, and beer. It's also commonly known as brewers or baker's yeast, and it is the main organism that we use as uh, for making our alcohol. Um, and it is also sort of one of the interesting things that we're not going to talk about this course is, uh, is exactly is, is that it's actually been domesticated. So it's an actually a domesticated microbe. It was a wild one, but it's now a domesticated one. And I'll also mention that the, the most common type of Saccharomyces that we use is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, and it's interesting, cerevisiae means of beer. So it's sugar fungus of beer for Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And this is what it looks like. It's a pretty unspectacular microbe. You've used it in the lab one or two times. It's not particularly exciting to look at. It's very, very, um, very, very simple. So, but there is, but sort of diving a little bit deeper into the micro, microbiology of foods, the major fermentations we think about in terms of production of food are lactic, propionic, and ethanolic fermentations. And the purposes of food and fermentation have sort of three main things. So they preserve the food, and they do this by inhibiting um, or limiting microbial growth. Um, in particular, by um, producing an alcohol or by lowering the acidity of the environment. This also improves the digestibility by breaking down, say, plant fibers, if we're thinking about something like sauerkraut and cabbage, or something like miso. Um, it also adds nutrients, such as vitamins and flavor molecules, such as esters and sulfur compounds, making foods taste better. So, for instance, for those of you that, say, like sauerkraut like I do, uh, cabbages with before you ferment it, it tastes kind of meh, but when you ferment it, it gets all these nice flavors and it makes the cabbage easier to digest and it's actually pretty tasty. Um, and so the sort of interesting thing about uh, the, the microbiology of fermented food is that pretty much every culture, doesn't matter where you go in the world, whether it's here, whether it's in Africa, Europe, Australia, China, it doesn't matter where you go, there's, every culture has at least one fermented food. And even if you don't think about it, like something like coffee, which is sort of a worldwide thing is actually a fermented uh, food. And so there are lots of different types of fermented food, inc including uh, chocolate. And so chocolate production is actually a really important process. It actually gives chocolate most of its flavor. And it actually follows a really um, defined pattern of microbial succession inside the chocolate. And every time fermentation occurs, it changes the flavor of chocolate. And so we can look at days of fermentation of this chocolate, so zero to eight. We have uh, different organisms evolve, so yeast, lactic acid bacteria, acetic acid, acetic, acetic acid bacteria, and then spore formers and molds. And you notice is that it goes through a, a sort of a succession of producing alcohol, producing lactic acid, producing acetic acid, and then it's starting to get warmer and warmer and warmer ultimately leading to our delicious chocolate. But let's talk about this tree to bar chocolate making, because I'm sure many of you like chocolate. I know I do, um, and I know my wife does. 
Um, so the idea being is cocoa beans, they grow on the tree, um, kind of a weird thing. Uh, there's the pulp and the beans. Uh, and the idea being is that they allow those to ferment for two to 10 days or so. Um, and during this fermentation, the sugars are being converted by the yeasts and the to alcohol and CO2. And they're also be converting by, by lactic acid bacteria to lactic acid. And then these uh, the acetic acid bacteria as well as lactic acid bacteria continue to convert it um, into a sort of a different form. It also changes its color to the sort of bitter astringent and grayous. And then over time, as the fermentation continues, it develops flavor and precursors leading to a richer flavor, turning it browning. Then they eventually, eventually dry it. Um, and then they roast it, that gets flavors, adds the cocoa flavors, it gets rid of the bitterness and things like that. And eventually it goes through this whole process by preparing it for consumption. But ultimately it started off by getting the fermented products. And I will also note that the fermentation of uh, coffee actually follows a pretty similar uh, trajectory as well, because coffee again is a fermented drink. But um, ultimately coffee, cocoa beans, they don't look particularly uh, exciting once you harvest them, but um, but if you look at the time and days, um, you, you look at sort of the, the abundance of different bacteria. So these are the viable cells and you see that the yeast sort of pop up early because they're fermenting. They sort of die out over time. Lactobacillus again pops up early and then we start to see sort of this just standard progression of bacteria that really follows this progression that we're seeing here. And again, follows this, oops, follows this progression that we're seeing here. But there are a number of different fermented foods and things you might not think about. So there's coffee, they're fermented prior to roasting um, and, and it process again, very much like chocolate. Uh, there's lots and lots of fermented foods, pickles, sauerkraut, kimchi. If you like Tabasco, that's a fermented thing. Uh, sourdough bread is fermented as well. And there's a huge number of things. Um, and again, they're spread globally. It doesn't really matter where you are. Every culture has some sort of fermented food that takes some sort of raw ingredient, processes it with microbes, and gives you some sort of end product that is delicious, that has flavors, and sometimes smells that come from these microorganisms. But fermentation is not just good for making alcohol and chocolate. It's also important why we can, how we can limit the spoilage of food. And so I'm sure everyone has thrown away their fair share of food. Um, fun fact, if you, totaled up the amount of food waste globally. It is the third largest country in terms of total food um, consumed per year. Food waste is a huge thing. And so part of the reason we throw away so much food is actually because it's spoiled. And it's a process where food becomes unsuitable to ingest. We don't like the way it tastes or it's potentially toxic to us. As I mentioned, it's a really big deal. One third of the world's foods produced for consumption is lost every year due to spoilage. Um, this is typically due to bacteria and various fungus. Um, mostly, these, most of these organisms are not pathogenic, but they can actually produce some pretty toxic compounds. Um, but there are two um, exceptions to this. So that we have Clostridium perfringens, which we find in meat and poultry. This actually will cause gas gangrene. And Bacillus cereus, which we've worked with in the lab before, this is found in milk, cream, and rice, um, and they can be pathogenic. Um, that being said, there are, uh, relative to the bacteria, the fungi are linked to many, many serious health concerns as a whole. Um, but a great way to, to keep your food from spoiling is actually to ferment it. it because um, most of the pathogens that we know of um, cannot grow at low pHs, fermentation naturally produces things that drop the pH. So by dropping the pH, you inhi inhibit the growth of pathogenic microorganisms, um, which is actually really nice. Um, and one of the other things that fermentation does is it potentially increases the amount of probiotic bacteria, so bacteria that could potentially help you with your gut health. So it's kind of fun. Um, in addition, there are several products of fermentation that create acidic environments. So these include both lactic and acetic acid, um, and these are both a necessity for making foods we enjoy. Again, including like sauerkraut, kimchi, sourdough bread, all things that prevent that make things taste good, but also prevent the growth of pathogens. And remember, microbes are responsible for tons of really awesome flavors, textures, aromas, and that makes some food just taste better. Chocolate, remember, chocolate gets its flavor, coffee gets its part of its flavors from these microbes fermenting. So it's really important. Um, so we've really been thinking about yeasts in terms of, uh, of fermenters, but bacteria are capable of fermenting, um, and they typically don't produce alcohol as their final fermentation product. The most common 
bacteria we think of in terms of fermenters are what we call lactic acid bacteria or the LAB. And these include some microbes we've actually talked a little bit about. And I know at least one of you is doing your microbe wiki on one of these microbes, but uh, the most common bacteria of the lactic acid include lactobacillus, leuconostoc, pediococcus, lactococcus, and then streptococcus. And so we've talked about streptococcus in a clinical setting before, but it is a, a lactic acid fermenter and is actually important for the production of uh, in the production of foods. Um, and so these organisms, uh, sort of the core members as well as sort of these you know, non-core mem members are key organisms for fermentation and are a really good way to preserve food. Again, because they're dropping the pH, which inhibits the growth of potentially pathogenic or potential spoilage microorganisms. So let's talk about a few of these um, other types of food outside of alcoholic fermentation. So let's start with yogurt. We believe yogurt was invented in Mesopotamia around 5000 BC. And yogurts are staples in many, many cultures and cuisines, um, whether you eat them directly with your food, mix them in with your food, or eat them as sort of part of, you know, uh, like just I'm going to have a cup of yogurt for a snack. Um, but they are produced by the bacterial fermentation of milk. And what ends up happening is the bacteria ferment the sugar lactose, which then produces lactic acid. And what this does, it actually acts on the proteins inside milk, um, sorry, inside the milk to give these um, yogurts its texture as well as their tart flavor. And yogurt fermentation is typically, um, and there's lots of different types of yogurt out there, but Typically speaking, these are um, conducted by Lactobacillus delbrickii, as well as Streptococcus thermophiles. And uh, again, there are many other types of Lactobacillus out there. And there's also some bacteria out there called Bifidobacteria um, that can be added to or uh, during or after in culturing yogurt to make them what we call probiotic. Um, spoiler alert, probiotic um, don't really work, but that's, uh, that's neither here nor there. And again, uh, these organisms, get, remember, take a raw milk product, convert it into something that tastes very different. Again, all the flavors and the texture are microbial in origin. Um, next up is cheese. And again, cheese is a way of preserving milk. And so the idea being is it's sort of a two-step process. And so we can think about something like Swiss cheese here. But the bacteria are converting lactose into lactic acid. And this is typically done by Lactococcus lactis. And they're typically used to make cheeses like cheddar. We also know that to make cheeses like mozzarella, we need, we need streptococcus. Um, we also add bacteria to produce flavors and textures. And so this sort of occurs in a two-stage process. So when we're making something like cheese, we, we have lactobacillus fermenting the lactose into lactic acid. And so in the first stage at a very high temperature, our thermophilic lactic acid bacteria, such as this, our friend here, Lactococcus lactis, or other species of Lactococcus, um, ferment the milk sugar lactose uh, into uh, lactic acid. Second part, we have a bacteria called uh, propionic bacteria that converts that lactic acid to propionate, acetate, and CO2. Um, so if we're thinking about something like Swiss cheese, where this process occurs a lot, the propionic bacteria converts that lactic acid to, and, into CO2, and that creates the bubbles and it creates the holes inside of cheese. And that sort of that, that distinctive flavor of Swiss cheese actually is due to, again, to that microbial um, that microbial sort of this, that flavor of Swiss cheese. Not a fan of Swiss cheese personally, but um, actually I am on certain things. But as a whole, I don't really like the taste of Swiss cheese. It's too like punchy of a taste. But uh, depending on what different types of <clears throat> cheeses you have, you have different types of bacteria. So this is four different types of cheeses. And so we have soft cheese, uh, semi-hard cheese, hard cheese, and then cheese rind. And you'll notice that the type of bacteria is radically, radically different. Each color corresponds to a different genera of bacteria. Uh, cheese molds are another sort of <clears throat> thing we need to think about as well. So um, if you've ever had something like camembert or brie, the outside coating of those have that rind, and that rind is comprised of bacteria and molds. And remember, molds are just fungus. So the most common type of mold we see is actually white mold, and this is due to Penicillium camberti, and this is the most popular and most commonly used species of mold to make these types of cheese. And again, it's responsible for that white lawn of surface of cheeses like camembert or brie. And this mold actually metabolizes some of the, uh, some of the fats present in the cheese, and it gives the sort of the aromas and the textures and tastes associated with many, many of these cheeses. Um, and and uh, personally thinking they're kind of gross. <laughs> 
Um, in addition to white mold, we have blue mold. And this is typically done by two species of penicillium. Um, and they give the sort of that distinctive blue color to blue cheeses, as well as the unique flavor and texture. Um, and they need oxygen. So actually these cheeses have holes. So let me, take, let me just show you a peek. So this is uh, penicillium camberti. Um, you see it's that this is going to be a camembert as a cheese. Um, it's like one of those soft cheeses. You'll, oops, sorry about that. Uh, you'll see, see that the, this is the penicillium. It grows on the surface of the cheese, giving it its white color. But again, also injecting that those smells and flavors. And this is the penicillium in blue cheese. Um, that Remember, this fungus needs oxygen, so you'll see blue cheese oftentimes has holes. But you can see the fungus just spread throughout the cheese. Um, these are non-pathogenic organisms. Um, so they're 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 not harmful to you at all. They don't they don't cause anything bad. In fact, they prevent pathogens from coming in, as we've discussed before. Um, not my cup of tea, but I know many people like these things. So next up is actually cured sausages, and these include things like salami or pepperoni. Um, these are good cured sausages. So the really cheap sausages or pepperonis you buy at the store typically aren't fermented like this or prepared, but really good salami and pepperoni typically are. So the idea being is that prior to this process, they, they add starter cultures of lactic acid bacteria um, and they allow them to grow inside these meat for several days. And these bacteria will ferment any sugar present to produce lactic acid, which lowers the pH of, this, of these sausages and, and, and salamis and pepperonis. Um, again, which inhibits pathogens. And what this does is it actually coagulates the proteins and it actually reduces the meat's water holding capacity. So it allows these meats to dry out dry better and it also bums out pathogens. And then finally, the flavor itself relies much, much more on these bacteria. Um, sausages don't have a great taste sort of raw, but the, you have to add something or you have to allow bacteria to add something. So, um, in addition, microbes can indirectly affect our foods. And so microbes contribute to food production in many, many ways. So as we talked about um, when we had the soil lecture, microbes contribute to nitrogen fixation. So they, historically speaking, microbes provided almost all of the nitrogen um, <clears throat> that we used in our fields um, until we developed the process to, to industrially make um, uh, fertilizer through the Haber-Bosch process here. But it does still provide about half the nitrogen we use for our food, and it is the basis for crop rotation. So people will rotate crops to essentially put natural nitrogen in there. Um, in addition, as we've mentioned, microbes are the basis of food web, and so they allow energy to move up, up, up the food web to make things bigger, which we in turn eat. Um, in addition, microbes are uh, responsible for making uh, us sick in our food. Um, and they're great for making food and alcohol, but they're also responsible for some pretty nasty diseases. Um, and so uh, they're typically acquired from improperly cooked, handled, or store food. Um, naturally speaking, all plants and animals are colonized by bacteria, and many of these organisms can be potential pathogens if not removed or handled properly. And typically speaking, we generally get rid of them during cooking. Um, but illnesses can result from pathogenic bacteria and viruses that have not been properly moved uh, either by washing or by cooking. Um, and the typical, typical sort of uh, <clears throat> symptoms we see with foodborne illnesses include vomiting, fever, fever, aches, and headaches, and things like that, and may include diarrhea. Um, typically, most foodborne illnesses are not deadly, but that being said, there's always people that... Um, as, as you probably have noticed throughout your life, there's always people that uh, do be, uh, uh, that are susceptible and do pass away due to these foodborne illnesses. Um, there are many, many uh, different types of bacteria um, that cause um, foodborne illnesses, but there are three major players here. Uh, the most important foodborne illness is actually Campylobacter jejuni. It causes about 77% of all foodborne illnesses. Uh, next up is actually Salmonella. Um, not, it, it's, I'm sure you all have heard of this from uh, raw chicken. Um, and then finally is E. coli, which um, I'm sure many of you heard about a couple of years ago when uh, Chipotle had a shutdown for a while because of E. coli and outbreaks. Uh, and then a very small percentage of them um, come from other different types of pathogens, including like norovirus, um, I'm sorry, other different types of, of bacterial pathogens like Bacillus cereus, and there's a whole other list of them. But the vast majority of them, again, come from Campylobacter, Salmonella, and E. coli. Um, but as we all know, bacteria do need time to grow and 
um, and they need time to grow, they need time to produce toxins, and symptoms typically are not seen until 12 to 72 hours after eating the contaminated food. Um, that being said, there are some species of Staphylococcus that can make you sick within 30 minutes, but there is a very predictable timeline where you do start to see symptoms if you do have food poisoning. So it's pretty easy to rule out if you have food poisoning um, after consuming something. Um, so as I mentioned, Campylobacter jejuni is the most common bacterial cause of food, more, food poisoning in Europe and the United States, and it's actually one of the most common causes of human gastroenteritis in the world. Um, the, the infections can be pretty severe in your gut, but very rarely do people die. Um, Campylobacter enters through your, your GI mucosa and produces enterotoxins, which lead to diarrhea. Uh, fun fact, um, uh, Campylobacter is found on in nearly all poultry products, and it, it, depending on what study you look at, it ranges between 20 to 100% of chickens sampled. But ultimately, Campylobacter can be just cooked, killed by cooking. As with most things, you heat it to a high enough temperature, it will die and not cause any diseases. Uh, next up is sal salmonella. It's actually an intercellular pathogen. Uh, salmonellosis is an asymptomatic infection caused by the bacteria of any salmon uh, salmonella type. Um, the most common symptoms from salmonellosis include uh, diarrhea, fever, abdominal cramps, and vomiting as well as enteritis, which is inflammation of the small intestine. Um, however, um, if you have a severe enough infection, it can actually lead to typhoid fever. So um, if it enters your lymphatic system, it becomes uh, systemic. So uh, just as a reminder, your, your lymphatic system is sort of the, the, the waste dump of your immune system. Um, as we mentioned, in the United States, it's relatively common. There's about 1.2 million cases of salmonella infections every year, which causes about 450 people to die. Um, and uh, the sources, again, are contaminated food. Um, it's typically, we think about salmonella and poultry, and so they find about 20% of chickens test positive for salmonella, but you can also get salmonella poisoning from raw veggies and well as not cooking your eggs well enough. Um, that being said, about 142,000 Americans are affected from chicken eggs, and about 30 of them die. Um, and I also, I also note that it was actually the agent of the first and largest bioterrorism attack in the United States history. So in uh, 1984, a group did sprinkle salmonella on the salad bar of eight restaurants, which caused 750 people to contract salmonella, and 45 were hospitalized. No, no one died, just as a note. So there has been uh, bioterror attacks using salmonella. Not a very uh, effective uh, bioterror agent, but um, it certainly caused a lot of people a lot of discomfort for a couple of days. Um, so next up is, is going to be E. coli. Uh, and so E. coli, is, uh, as we've talked about before, is a non, uh, is, I'm sorry, is a uh, common uh, gut microbe, so it's a non-pathogenic organism typically found in your gut. It comprises about 1% of all bacteria that you find inside your colon. Um, that being said, the E. coli that we work with in lab and the vast majority of species and subspecies of E. coli um, are non-pathogenic, but some of them can be really, really deadly, including E. coli 017H7. And this is the most common type of bacteria E. coli that we associated with deaths from foodborne E. coli. Um, it produces a, what we call a shiga toxin that can lead to bloody diarrhea or hemorrhagic diarrhea, kidney failure, and eventually death. And this is contributed by uh, the fecal oral route, meaning that poop was on your raw food, you consumed it, and then it infected you. Um, it is really common in raw milk, uncooked vegetables, and raw and undercooked beef. Um, and it has been associated with large and publicized outbreaks. Recently, it was in Chipotle. They, uh, a, few pe a few dozen people got it, and I think at least three or four people died from it. Um, we've seen it multiple times over the years on romaine, lettuce, and spinach recalls. It's, there's one almost every other year. Um, it's just fecal contamination of agricultural fields. Um, but one of the most highly publicized was actually the Jack in the Box E. coli. And what ended up happening is in 1993, undercook fecal contaminated beef patties were served to thousands of people, which led to 732 infections, 180 sustained permanent injury, and the death of four children. So that is our bacteria. Um, let's talk briefly about viruses, because um, viruses, they're not as sort of uh, common in terms of infectious 
pathogens in food, but they do make up about one third of the cases of food poisoning in developed countries. Um, fun fact, the United States leads the way because it causes viral infections do cause about 50% of cases in the United States in terms of foodborne illnesses. Um, for instance, the norovirus, which uh, is the most common of all viral sources of food poisoning in the United States. This is uh, response. This was responsible for the BU Chipotle outbreak a few years ago that we had here in Massachusetts. Um, I remember getting all sorts of emails from my Chipotle rewards count about all the stuff they were doing to try to prevent this from happening again. But um, it is referred to commonly as the winter vomiting bug, and it is the most common cause of gastroenteritis. Caused 50 percent, seven percent of outbreaks of. Of, of gastroenteritis in the United States in 2004. It is something that is super duper easy to catch and transmit it, and all that vomiting and diarrhea makes it very, very easy to spread viral particles. And it really only, unlike bacteria, where you oftentimes need you know, thousands or tens of thousands to infect a host, um, it only takes one viral particle to get you infected. Um, um, in, in this case, um, so other viruses need more. Like COVID-19, you need more exposure than one virus, but that's beyond, that's not really, relevant here. Um, food, foodborne viral infections also have a one to three incubation period as the viruses continue to build up, but they can actually evolve, I'm sorry, um, resolve pretty quickly. And then finally, there's also some other viral sources of food poisoning, including enteroviruses, hep A and E, as well as rotavirus. And this is just a nice table showing some um, bacterial pathogens, um, ranging from Staph aureus to Salmonella to Shigella and so on and so forth. Their incubation periods, do they cause vomiting, vomiting, diarrhea, and fever, and what is their source? So it's a really nice little handy table from the uh, McGraw-Hill company. So uh, let's wrap this lecture up by just a few key summary points. So microbes have played a huge role in food for millennia, particularly with the fermenters and fermentation. You're thinking about alcohol, you're thinking about yogurt, you're thinking about fermented vegetables, coffee, things like that, chocolate, for those of you that love chocolate. Uh, fermentation does produce many important compounds like alcohol and acids. And these contribute to the flavor and the ability to store and preserve foods. Fermented foods are much safer than non-fermented foods, um, and fermented foods much have a have much more rich palette of flavors, smells, and texture than non-fermented foods. And then while microbes can be harnessed for producing foods and make foods safer, they're also sources of food poisoning, and they can be particularly deadly um, depending on the pathogen in question. Um, but with that, that's going to be the end of today's lecture. Please let me know if you have any questions, and I hope you enjoyed this sort of uh, lighter side of microbiology in the second part of this lecture, thinking about how foods are made. And if you have any questions about this food part, please let me know. I could talk about food microbiology for days because it's a really, really fun part of microbiology um, to think about. And I hope you all are doing well. Take care.